In support of our previous video on the Mongol destruction of the Tangut Kingdom in 1227, we shall present how the Mongols themselves presented this campaign. The Secret History of the Mongols, written for the Mongol royal family in stages after Chinggis Khan's death in 1227, provides a unique and highly valuable account of the establishment of the Mongol Empire in their own words. We will discuss the secret history itself in more detail in future videos, but for now, let us see how the Mongols remembered the final campaign of their great leader. Below is from the translation by Igor de Reshevitz, though alternative translations will be provided in the description. After spending the winter there, Chinggis Khan said, I shall set forth against the Tangut people. He counted his troops anew and in the autumn of the Year of the Dog set forth against the Tangut people. From among the ladies he took with Yisui Khatun. In the winter, Chinggis Khan, riding his steed Josutu Boru, on the way hunted the many wild asses of Arbuka. When the wild asses passed close by them, Josutu Boru took fright. Chinggis Khan fell off the horse and, his body being in great pain, he halted at Korohat. He spent that night there and the following morning, Yasui Khatun said, Princes and commanders, consult each other on what to do. The Khan has spent the night, his body hot with fever. Thereupon, the princes and commanders assembled and Tolun Cherbi of the Khan Khotan advised as follows. The Tangut people are ones who have towns with pounded earth walls, are ones who live in permanent camps. They won't leave, carrying off their towns with pounded earth walls. They won't leave, abandoning their permanent camps. Let us withdraw. Then, when the Han's body is cooled down, we shall set out again. When he spoke thus, all the princes and commanders agreed with his words and petitioned Chinggis Khan accordingly. But Chinggis Khan said, The Tangut people will say that we turn back because we lost heart. However, if we send envoys to them and watch right here at Korohat, which turns my illness takes, and withdraw after considering their reply, that would be fine. And so he sent envoys to carry the following message. In the past, you, Burhan, said, We, the Tangut people, shall be your right wing. Although told so by you, when I sent you a request for troops, saying that I was going on campaign because the Sartaul people had not agreed to my proposal, you, Burhan, did not keep your promise and did not give me troops, but came out with mocking words. As I was moving in a different direction at the time, I said that I would call you to account later. I set out against the Sartaur people, and being protected by eternal heaven, I brought them duly under submission. Now, I have come to call Burhan to account for his words. Burhan said, I did not speak the mocking words. Thereupon, Asha Gambu said, I spoke the mocking words. As for now, if you Mongols who are used to fighting say, let us fight, then turn towards the Alashan and come to me, for I have an encampment in the Alashan. I have tents of thin woolen cloth. I have camels laden with goods. Let us fight there. If you need gold, silver, sateen, and other goods, turn towards Erichara and Eriju. He sent this message to Chinggis Khan. When his words were conveyed to Chinggis Khan, his body was still hot with fever. Chinggis Khan said, This is enough. When one lets oneself be addressed so boastfully, how can one withdraw? Even if we die, let us challenge their boasts. And saying, Eternal Heaven, you be the judge. He moved in the direction of Alashan. He arrived there and fought with Ashagambu. He overcame Ashagambu and forced him to barricade himself up on the Alashan. He captured Ashagambu 
and plundered his people who had tents of thin wool and cloth, who had camels laden with goods until they were blown to the winds like hearth ashes. He then gave the following order. Kill the valiant, the bold, the manly, and the fine tanguts, and let the soldiers take for themselves as many of the common tanguts as they can lay hands on, and capture. Genghis Khan spent the summer on Jasutu Mountain. He sent troops against the tanguts who had tents of thin woolen cloth, who had camels laden with goods, and who, with Ashagambu, had made for the mountains and were offering resistance. He caused his troops to plunder them as planned until they were utterly destroyed. Then, showing favor to Borochu and Mukali, he ordered that they should take as much booty as in their judgment their strength could carry. Further, Chinggis Khan ordered to reward Borochu and Mukali as follows. Since I did not give you a share of the Kitat people, the two of you take and divide equally between yourselves the Juyin of the Kitat people. Go and make their fine sons follow you, holding your falcons. Bring up their fine daughters and make them arrange the hems of your wives' skirts. The trusted friends of the Altan Han of the Kitat people are the Harahitat Juyin people who have destroyed the ancestors of the Mongols. Now, you too, Boruchu and Mukali, are my trusted friends. Chinggis Khan moved away from the Jasutu mountain and set up camp at the city of Urahai. After setting out from the city of Urahai, while he was destroying the city of Dormage, Borhad came to pay homage to Chinggis Khan, presenting himself with gifts such as, in the first place, golden images of Buddha, then golden and silver bowls and vessels, nine of each kind. Boys and girls, nine of each, Geldings and camels, nine of each, and all sorts of other objects arranged in nines, according to their color and form. Chinggis Khan kept the door closed and made Burhan pay homage outside the tent. On that occasion, when Burhan paid homage, Chinggis Khan felt revulsion within his heart. On the third day, Chinggis Khan issued an order giving Ilhur Burhan the name Chidurhu, being thus visited by Ilhur Burhan Shidurhu. Chinggis Khan then ordered that Ilhur be put to death and that Tolancher be seized and execute him with his own hands. After he had plundered the Tangut people and making Ilhur Burhan change his name to Shidurhu, had done away with him, and after having exterminated the Tangut people's mothers and fathers down to the offspring, of their offspring maiming and taming, Chinggis Khan gave the following order. While I take my meals, you must talk about the killing and destruction of the Tangut and say, maimed and tamed, they are no more. Because the Tangut people gave their word but did not keep it, Chinggis Khan for the second time took the field against them. Having destroyed the Tangut people, Chinggis Khan came back and in the year of the pig, ascended to heaven. After he had ascended to heaven, a great part of the Tangut people was given to Yesui Hatun. I have read the secret history of the Mongols in full several times now, and the description of the Tangut's destruction always stands out to me. There is scholarly argument over when the secret history was written either in the Hurultai following Chinggis' death, or following the ascension of Menk in the 1250s. Personally, I've always fallen into the camp that an initial section was compiled circa 1228 to 1229 and edited over the course of the 13th century, when the short accounts of Ergadai's reign and other small details were added. If first written in the year immediately following Chinggis' death in 1227, then the events and destruction of the Tangut Kingdom were still vivid in the minds of the writers. The paragraph on the maiming and taming of the Tangut comes across as especially visceral. We get a sense not just of a Mongol hatred for the Tangut, but that their destruction was seen as deserved and total. The secret history is generally poor with the names of non-Mongols and often hazy on the details of Mongol campaigns, yet 
the Tanka campaign is comparatively well recounted, and that Asagamu's clear character stands out suggests the level of contempt the Mongols had for him. This is for me suggestive that it was written rather soon after the events. For comparison, in the Secret Histories version of the Khorezmian campaign, the Khorezm Shah Muhammad and his son Jalal al-Din Mingburnu are conflated into one person, while the series of Jin emperors over the 13th century are almost entirely referred to as a singular Altan Khan. While we will be discussing theories around Genghis's death in the next video, we see here why it was such a controversial topic. The secret history, possibly our closest source to the actual events, just has him ascend into heaven. As a rule, the Mongols considered it a great taboo to discuss details around death, or even death itself. So by that count, we should not be too surprised on that. But it provides such tantalizing clues before that. Spending time on Chinggis's fall from his horse, that he suffered a fever. In the section where Chinggis refuses to come out of his tent to see the Tangut King, it is generally assumed that by this point he was already dead, for there was little else to explain such an out-of-character decision as the Khan hiding in his gear for three days. It supplies these interesting details, but in typical fashion of the secret history, refuses to make the connection. This is part of why the secret history can be such a difficult source to work with. Providing a totally unique insight as one of the rare occasions when a step society produced an internal history in their own language, yet so often we cannot know if a section is meant to be taken literally, as a reference or literary device that, over the course of centuries and translations, we cannot fully appreciate. For the Mongol royal family reading it, what would they have known that we cannot? What was the reader expected to know going into it? Never intended for a wide audience, the secret history is not so easily dismissed as propaganda, but neither can we fully trust it, or see it as a one-to-one -one presentation of history. These issues, part of what makes the secret history so fascinating, will be explored as we delve into the work itself in future videos.